way I really want to get to today's conversation, which is a conversation with experts uh, on gangs and gang violence in the region uh, and in, in a conversation about the policies adopted by President uh, Bukele in El Salvador, the much commented policies by President Bukele in El Salvador. Uh, most of the conversation and the articles that I think most of us have seen on this, um, both internationally and even in domestically in El Salvador, uh, has been primarily focused on the human rights issues and dimensions um, and the fundamental legal principles involved with the measures that he's adopted, such as the es essentially suspension of habeas corpus uh, in due process. Uh, and there's been other emphasis on what the, sh what the apparent short-term uh, uh, results have been of his policies, although this information is difficult to independently verify because it's just government-produced uh, um, uh, facts, as it were, or, or um, uh, figures. Um, those are all; those are both important fo focus to have on this. But that's not what we're going to focus on today. What we're going to talk about today is the merits of of President Bukele's policies and his assertion that his policy his policies will permanently cripple and or dismantle the gangs and free El Salvador in one form or another of the gang-related crime and the gang-controlled neighborhoods. Um, we have assembled four of the leading experts uh, in the region, about the region, uh, with years of experience and, and years um, working in this field in El Salvador and in other countries that have experienced gang violence, significant gang violence, um, and gang control, certainly in major swatch, swatches of the area. Um, and the idea is to evaluate uh, the claims that President Bukele has been making about his policies, not just in short term, but medium and long term as well. Um, before introducing the panelists, I just want to add one note to today's proceedings that we had uh, numerous and ongoing conversations with the very senior representative of the El Salvadoran government uh, and, and, and hoped and in, that he could join us. Uh, for this conversation. We originally thought that that was going to happen. At the last minute, we found out that that was not going to happen. Um, and our attempts to gain uh, some, some uh, attendance by somebody in the government um, by either changing the date um, or having someone else from the government participate, um, was that offer was not taken up. And so, um, but we tried to have somebody from the El Salvadoran government explaining their views of what's been going on. So let is, let's go to our panelists today. We have first Ben Lessing, who's professor and director of the Center for Latin American Studies at the University of Chicago, um, who also goes by the, the very uh, colorful Twitter handle of Big Big B Lessing, um, which, I, which I compliment you for, Ben. There's Joanna Montero, professor and director of the Institute of Public Security at the Gertulio Vargas Foundation in the Abape School of, of Administration in Brazil. Uh, Maria Micaela Sfiacci, who's assistant professor at Princeton University. And last but certainly not least, Santiago Tobon, professor at AFIT in Medellin and co-chair of the Crime Reduction and Police Accountability Group, the Evidence and Governance in, Pol in Politics Network based in Berkeley, California. I hope, Santiago, I got that full title um, correct. I did my best. Um, so let's go, let's go straight away to, to the issues. And, and maybe we could call on Maria first to talk a little bit about the factual predicate uh, before we get on with evaluating what has been going on. And maybe Maria, uh, or Mika, Maria, you could, you could help us a little bit by telling us a little bit about the nature, the history and the nature of the gangs in, Alvesor, in, in El Salvador, what their tactics have been, what their quote business lines have been, um, what was the, the general accepted gang related you know, rate of crime, um, and and basically, what is the best estimate of the nature and rate now after a year of of President Bukele's policies? So, Mika, I call on you first. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ken, for organizing this. So, so telling you the nature of these gangs was actually 
exported. This was something that uh, was due to criminal deportations that were coming from the US. And these gang members, basically, when they came back to El Salvador, they brought skills that they didn't learn in El Salvador, but they learned in Los Angeles in the US, which were basically criminal skills related to extortion. For example, we have very uh, detailed data in El Salvador about criminal activity, and we see very clear how neighborhoods that were transformed after the arrival of these gang leaders from the US, and you start seeing the expansion actually of these two gangs, MS-13 and neighborhood 18, right after the arrival of these uh, criminal deportees. And actually before this wave of deportation in 1996, El Salvador did not have any organized gangs. So just to keep you in context about this. And as I said, most of these deportees, what they found in El Salvador was actually the perfect place to expand their extortion activities. They knew how to coordinate, they knew the importance of establishing boundaries to, of territorial control to, to extort. And also they recruited very young kids, Salvadorian kids from the local population. So they did not only brought these criminal skills, but also a sense of belonging for many children that were idle after the civil conflict. So what do we see? In these territories of gun control, we observe actually worse economic outcomes. All this, what I'm talking is before 2022, okay? I'm talking about 1996 up to 2022. And moreover, the other thing that I see in the data is that when these gangs arrive, since they were rivals, they start competing for territory to extort. So what happens? Violence increase, homicides increase. There were also some, uh, as you know, iron fist policies in the middle that made increase the powers of these gangs. They went to jail. We're going to talk about it in the, in the next questions. But the bottom line is that the homicide rates were in 2015 about like 100 per 100,000 population, which is highest than places that have civil war. And most of this violence was attributed to gang violence and competition for territory to extort. So the main business was extortion. So all this before uh, Bukele, and this, what I'm telling you, is validated by the research that we have done so far with a team of researchers over these years. Now, post Bukele. Here, I think that we can divide the period in two periods of Bukele. One, when just started, no? And until March, 2022, which there were two different strategies. So let's focus on the first period before March, 2022, which then we will call the other period as the war on gangs. So focusing on the first period, and here, all what I'm going to tell you is mostly based on, on what I read in the media, which basically several media outlets mentioned that Bukele negotiated with gangs a reduction in homicides in exchange to better conditions for these leaders of these gangs in prisons. So basically what they say is that these lower members that were in the streets, you know, they follow basically the instructions of these leaders that basically packed with the government and reduce homicides as the local neighborhoods. Something important of the structure of El Salvador, if you don't know, is that they have these leaders that are in prisons that they coordinated all these lower members that were in El Salvador in cliques and clicas, no? So however, I want to highlight that even though there was a reduction in homicides as part of the negotiations, in general, this can also, so we can see it in data actually that there is a reaction in homicides. We cannot know whether it was the pact or not, but there was a reaction in homicides in the first period of Bukele. But something important that I want to highlight is that this could also increase the power of these other groups. For example, there was qualitative evidence saying that maybe disappearances started and also extortions did not stop. And on this, I can also relate to previous evidence that we have of other pacts that were done between gangs to reduce homicides, where we also see that, okay, you have this reduction in homicides, but you see an increase in, for instance, in extortion payments. So you see this trade-off between homicides. So this could potentially also happen in this period of Bukele, no? even though I haven't seen the data on this. But at least I know from other periods that this led a reduction in homicides led to an increase in extortion. Now, let's focus on the second period, no? 2022. Here is where negotiations broke down and the president said, okay, this is the period of war against the gangs. The president sent national police and armed forces to all the neighborhoods with the idea to take out gangs from the communities. This is the period where anecdotal evidence tells us that crimes committed by gangs disappear. And actually, if you see the homicide rate actually went down, actually it went from this 100 that I told you in 2015 to eight per 100,000 populations in 2022. But something important, and I think that this is very relevant to understand the effects of this policy, is that during this crackdown, there was almost no resistance by the gangs. 
which is very strange. And I think that this and several also uh, news outlets had pointed out that it is related to the previous pacts that gangs basically were the low member gangs were expecting Bukele to continue these packs and only these crackdowns to be temporary. And that's why they didn't resist. And this is very important, no? Because this is the main difference with other crackdowns where you see that gangs fight back and there is a spike in violence. So what do we know from the data? Actually, and this is very recent. So there is this, uh, there is an NGO that collected geocoded data in San Salvador, which is very important because in San Salvador we have a lot of neighborhoods that were under gang control, no? And what we did was to analyze with a group of researchers this data before and after the crackdown, comparing neighborhoods that have been under the control of gangs with neighborhoods that were always under the control of the state. No? What do we see? We actually validate some of these anecdotes that people were saying that now they could move freely. And this, we see it in the data. We see actually that there is in change in short-term mobility and also economic outcomes. Before the crackdowns, we have a whole actually paper, which we call labor mobility and development, where we see that people that were living in these neighborhoods in, in San Salvador, they couldn't move freely. They couldn't even go to the beach, even though it was 20 minutes away. Now, after the crackdown with these new surveys, what we are seeing is that those gaps close, okay? So we see something that is going on, at least at the short terms. So it can happen. So this is something that we are observing. Moreover, we also see some areas that economic conditions bit improving, no? Now, the question is, is this the whole story? What I'm telling you is very localized, no? Very short run. Now, to get a bet better picture of the long term and also all displacement effect, because potentially these gangs, they left these neighborhoods in San Salvador in the urban areas that were basically clean up, if you're going to call it, uh, with the policy of Ukele, but they could have moved to rural areas, no? And this is something that we don't know. And that's why we are collecting new data now over the summer with all this research team to try to understand this uh, displacement and also which could be the long-term effects no, about uh, this. And also there is something else that is important to, to understand. Even though we see a decline in homicides, we are seeing in the data these uh, improvements in mobility and now people go more often you know, to the cinemas, to, the, to clubs, to sport clubs, like move much more because what you had before was like also restriction of mobility. Apart from the violence, you had other consequences, negative consequences than gangs that were extortion and these restrictions of freedom for these people. But there is something that I think is uh, also relevant to understand and this is what we are trying to collect in the data is whether this could lead a damage on institutions and democracy if now people tend to justify more practices that go against institutions in order to improve security. And this is what we are trying to understand with collecting information about what happened in these communities and nearby areas. Thank I don't you. know if someone wants to add a bit no. more about this. Yeah, thank you, Mickey. Does anybody want to jump, jump in on that? I guess, the, yeah, Santiago, go ahead, because I guess where I wanted to get to next, but Santiago, again, I'm, I'll give you the space and anybody and Ben, if you want to jump in on this, is as is, is we understand the policies, it's it's mostly consisted of rounding up quote suspects, um, sort of somewhat indiscriminately, some like based on information, uh, and throwing it in a, in a massive building a massive jail to hold them all. Um, have there been any other in addition to the ones I met the 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 suspension of legal rights, which we talked about in the introduction, but is there any evidence that this has been complemented by um, any other measures to bring in pre increased presence of the state in those areas, or more police stations, more um, you know courts, or you know quick administration of justice, or um, or programs in in prison to, to reduce overcrowding, to have rehabilitation? Is there anything else involved in this policy? or is it just basically round up and hold them that we know of? Okay, I can answer this uh, unless yeah. Santiago wants to answer. So the short answer is not, but still we have to see because I, 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 I want to be, give a caution because I haven't gone to the country since uh, the new government. The main component is, as you, are say, as you said, it was massive incarceration and tough policies against uh, gangs. Moreover, we also know that they constructed a new prison that is the largest in the region. Some media outlets were saying that it has the capacity for 40,000, which means that there will be a lot of overcrowding. I think and on this, Ben will be able to talk a bit more. 
And we also know for a lot of work in, in the US, Brazil, Colombia, and also our own work in El Salvador, that this can also be affecting no, gangs. But in terms of remedial measures, no, which is what you're asking, it's very little. We don't know about any problem of rehabilitations of inmates so far, but again, I want to highlight this, that we haven't talked to anyone in government, so maybe sometimes they have these problems that are here, but so far, nothing, and nobody in the field has told me about any rehabilitation program. There is, however, one program that appeared in the news, which is called Plan Zero Ocio, which aim is that prisoners will provide to the community some type of compensation for the damages that gangs generated, but I could not get more information about this program than what I'm just telling you, no? So we don't know if it has been implemented, what's going on no, with this. In terms of increased government presence in this neighborhood control like gangs, I think this is very uh, important and interesting. So, so far we know that the police has not established here. It comes and goes, the same is with um, armed forces. So they are not constantly in the communities. We know that they enter and they leave. The only program that I could find about social prevention is this called CUBOS, which is similar to the idea they have in Medellin, which are urban social opportunity centers for um, young people. Basically, these are like to provide solution to basic education, entertainment for needs, like kind of like a cultural center for kids. I think this could be a promising program, no? Given that we know that gangs tend to recruit a lot of young kids before the age of 15, this could be something interesting. But again, I could not find that much information about this printed program and neither an impact evaluation of whether this had any effect. But that's, those were the only tools that, um, that we found basically by asking people and basically, uh, but not more than that. In terms of these things that you said, of the state courts there, no, nothing yeah. of that. Thank, thanks, Mika. Sorry, Santiago, you want to jump in? <laughs> Uh, sure. Thanks, Ken. Uh, I just want to come to complement uh, Mika's uh, answers in in two directions. One, to complement the context, like there are like particular characteristics of gangs in El Salvador that make them a bit different to other types of gangs that we've been studying in other parts of Latin America, for instance, in Medellin or Rio de Janeiro or Mexico, which is that the behavior of these gangs has been historically uh, been more predatory than in other contexts, such as, and I'm going to, to, to talk, to, talk to, you, to you about specifically the case of Medellin. In Medellin, for instance, and this also happens in Rio de Janeiro, but in, in Medellin, we've been studying this a lot. Uh, gangs have some sort of incentives to behave in a better way with communities, uh, mainly to protect like a rich illicit markets, such as the drug trade, right? While what we see in El Salvador is that because there's no like major illicit business such as uh, uh, such as um, uh, like a like a dynamic uh, retail drug market, then they engage much more in extortion, and this shapes a lot the behavior in which gangs approach communities. So, uh, so in general, like this pattern that we've been seeing in other places across the region of gangs becoming a bit more disciplined in their behavior with like uh, communities. Uh, probably that that would not happen in, in El Salvador uh, uh, unless un, unless until there's like a like a like a drug market that develops enough, which is unlikely because El Salvador is just like a like a pass through uh, 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 um, like place for the for the for the illicit uh, narcotics industry. So that that on one side uh, on the other hand uh, to and to to think about this other question that you asked about uh, like other policies i think something that i've been uh, reading a lot uh, in these reports by el faro and other uh, uh, like independent news uh, uh, analysis of el salvador is related to like the type of perverse incentives that could end up uh, uh, because of the of the state of of, except, of exception, and in particular, I'm referring to, for instance, these like quotas that, in some instances, police officers have been uh, like forced to meet in terms of uh, arrests, for instance. So, if you allow people to conduct arrests in a relatively like free way, because of all these habeas corpus and other like, uh, in, now that they don't are they're, they're not required to to explain even to the to the detainee why they were detained and so on. If you allow them to do that, and on top of that, you put quotas on the number of people that you want them to arrest. Uh, in Colombia, we have an, a, a like a 
very cruel story on how that ends uh, with these like false positives in the in in a period where the where the national government was actually incentivizing uh, killings on the guerrilla and the paramilitaries and other groups and and, and militaries ended up killing civilians. So I think that uh, on top of the of not having perhaps these uh, alternative uh, programs, uh, the ones that Mika mentioned, but no others than that, uh, this th there's a big risk of this turning into a war between the between authorities and and communities rather than gangs. Thanks, Santiago. There's a lot in there, and we want, want to come back to the Medellin example. Ben, I think you wanted to jump in now, no? Yeah, that would be great. I wanted to um, first say a little bit about the prison side of Bukele's crackdown you know, and the policies and the policies there, and then maybe also, uh, you know, uh, care, uh, say a little bit more about how those interact with some of the unique characteristics of El Salvador's gangs uh, and and the kind of Mara structures. So to go start with sort of the, the, the policy side, you know, the reports that we have are that in, since, this, uh, since this sort of post, you know, 2022 crackdown up to the present, something on the order of 65,000 arrests, I, I believe, 60 to 65,000 arrests. Um, and uh, and there've also been numbers reported that this has uh, doubled El Salvador's prison population to around 100,000 people, giving it the highest incarceration rate in the world. Um, that's in part because the United States has, has um, decarcerated a little bit in the past few years. So the United States kind of has the world record for incarceration rates, which is mind boggling when you consider the size of the US population. But now El Salvador has taken that first place um, slot. And it's important to recognize that even before this wave, El Salvador was sort of number two, number three, depending on how you counted. So it was already a mass incarceration country. And locking up 60,000 people, if they had started at zero, would have made it a high incarceration country. So it's a, it is now the amongst the very highest incarcerators by any measure. Uh, and it's important to recognize that. The, from what I've been able to piece together, this new prison is supposed to have a capacity for 40,000 people. If it were filled to capacity, it would be overcrowded by any kind of international standard, just based on its size and the number of people per cell. So in many ways, it has been designed to be overcrowded. From what I can tell right now, they've, they, they, or at least from the videos they've released and the, and the journalists who've been given access, there's two to 4,000 prisoners there. It's not even clear whether it was a photo op. It's you know it's it's a little bit hard to trust. Um, it's a little bit hard to trust the government's sort of official communications because Bukele is this kind of Twitter, uh, you know, a, a, a avatar kind of guy. He he's, he he posts these videos. They're often they look staged. It, they, they certainly look like there's a, a a large number of of gang members and that they're being treated in a kind of a brutal fashion. But this. I mean, I hate to say it, but there's a kind of brutality porn aspect to this that makes you not even sure if it's, you know, it, it could be an exaggeration. Uh, he, and he, you know, he certainly that's part of his part of his you know, political strategy. That said, it certainly doesn't look good. There's another uh, key element to Bukele's prison policy, which is the idea of put it, desegregating the prisons, of forcing gang members from different gangs to live together. Um, and the and, and this is uh, yeah, I think to give a little context for for people who may not be familiar with the sort of prison gang nature of El Salvador's gangs of the Matas. Uh, uh, the, these are the uh, the Matas began life in Los Angeles, as, as Mika said. While in Los Angeles, they were brought into a prison-based criminal structure that was dominated by the Mexican mafia in Los Angeles's prison. Still today, the Mexican mafia. Uh, controls life in Latino part in, in, in over the Latin prison population in Southern California. It's a very powerful prison gang, and they sort of established power over many kinds of street gangs that were made up of Latino populations. Um, and part of the way they established power was because people from the streets would get brought to prison, and they would have to deal with the local power gang that was in power, which was the Mexican mafia. So when that process that Mika described and these uh, Mata, Mata leaders were deported to, to El Salvador and Central America in the 90s, they reestablished in Central America this same model of control. And in fact, uh, what we think of as the, the MS-13 today in El Salvador, the Matas, uh, is in some ways a replica of that prison-based model of control. Prisoned, the, the imprisoned leadership 
exerts control over street level cliques, extracts money from them, expects them to pay money from extortion rackets up the up the chain of command. Uh, and and this has been you know and, and and in many ways that structure formed during the early mano dura periods when incarceration rates began to rise uh, and El Salvador began to uh, occupy that place as number three incarceration rate in the world. And a key mechanism by which the gangs inside are able to exert force on the street is precisely the incarceration rate and the degree to which the state is just locking up everyone who looks like a gang. If the state is locking up everyone who looks like a, a gang member at a high rate, then if I'm a member, if I'm a young male, you know, low income, maybe I look like a gang member and the state's gonna lock me up because I look like a gang member, not because I've done anything or committed any crime, they're going to hold me in pretrial, pretrial detention without a trial for, for months on end in prisons that are controlled by the Matas, then I have every incentive to obey the Matas before I go to prison. I have every incentive to work with Mata leaders, to pay them a part, portion of my extortion uh, income, to, to, uh, you know, to be a part of this gang before I ever get to prison so that I will be in good standing when I get to prison. A key element of that power was that because of prison violence in this period in the early 2000s, particularly with prison massacre in 2003, the El Salvadorian state decided to segregate prisons and prison wings by gang. So you put the MS-13 in one part and you put the, uh, you, you put the Barrio de Xochitl in another part. This policy is very common throughout Latin America and especially in high incarceration states. You know, I'm a, a, my primary area of focus is Brazil and Brazil's prisons are all segregated by gang. Comando Vermelho, PCC, they have to be, or also get prison massacres. It's a safety mechanism, it's a safety measure. It's simply impossible, you know, when you have guard, prisoner to guard ratios that are typically on the order of, you know, 10 guards, uh, one guard per 10 prisoners, one guard for, for, for 20 prisoners, in some cases, one guard per 50 prisoners, or even 100 prisoners. There's just no way that they're going to be able to keep these gangs from killing each other if they're mixed together. Bukele has made a show of desegregating the prisons. And the logic isn't, you know, is not specious, right? His logic is that if I, if I break that prison control, that control that the gangs have over the prison cells, then I can break the leadership's control over what's going on on the street. If people on the street don't care what the leadership says because the leadership has no power inside those prison cells, then you break that chain of command, or at least that's the logic. Right? And if you can take away the sense of property that the gangs have over prison units, right? their whole prison units belong to one gang and a whole prison unit belongs to another gang. And when new gangs arise or there's a schism, the first thing they ask for is their own prison unit. It's a badge of honor. So if you can break that, I think the logic would run, then you can really you know, in, in, perhaps cripple the gangs. The problem is that it's, it, this is a very dangerous policy. It can lead to prison massacres, uh, as, as has happened in the past. It's also very hard to know if this is actually happening. When I went to research, okay, this, you know, Bukele is, you know, desegregating the gangs and the prisons. I actually found multiple stories from 2015, from 2017, from 2019 about other efforts to desegregate the prisons. It's happened in Brazil as well, where leaders say, I'm desegregating, there's no more, will these gangs be able to you know, rule the roost inside the prison? And they make these announcements of these policies and then you don't hear very much about it. Um, and, uh, uh, and so you can't, so it's, it's, it's quite difficult to verify, particularly governments like Bukele's who aren't gonna necessarily let reporters and people from human rights groups uh, and, and other observers into the cells to see what's actually happening. So personally, as a researcher, I am in doubt about the degree to which he has truly desegregated the prison. I'm also on the fence about whether it's a good idea because I fear for the lives of, of these prisoners, right? In overcrowded prisons, uh, it's, a, it's a tinderbox. On the other hand, you know, it's, it's, there's no doubt that segregation strengthens the gangs. So I think that that's a kind of a picture there where there's a lot that we don't know uh, and there's a lot of uh, uh, and there's a lot of potential danger, and there isn't a lot of sign of any kind of humanitarian or rehabilitatory policies. In fact, Bukele has is you know if you if you trust Bukele, it's, the prison is not meant to be rehabilitatory in his vision. He's quite clear that he thinks these people need to pay for what they've done. He says you know the, his uh, in the in the kind of videos you see the soldier the the administrator saying you're going to be here for decades. There doesn't seem to be. Um, even a even a sort of 
gesture or lip service paid to the idea that they could get an education or rejoin society in any kind of productive way. It's, it, the, even the rhetoric is entirely punitive. And if you count the, the government's own numbers uh, and, the, and the kind of guard, um, you know, guard prisoner to guard ratio that, that uh, even the, the government is sort of talking about, this looks like prisons with, a, you know, with just very, you know, next to no services for prisoners, very low uh, pr uh, prisoner to guard ratios. Um, so, so there's no, there's no reason to believe that this is going to, uh, you know, lead to better prison conditions. It almost certainly will lead to, to worse prison conditions, even if in the very short run, building this giant prison alleviates some of the other prisons. And I'm happy to say more about what, where this could go. You know, we don't know, but based on experiences in other countries, high incarceration rate countries whose criminal structures are based in prison, I think we are in a position uh, to at least sketch out some scenarios. That's great. Thanks, Ben. We definitely want to listen to that. We'll come back to that. Um, that sort of teed up that conversation really well. Before we get to that, I, I want to, to go to uh, Joanna uh, uh, to talk about other countries, and in Joanna's case, I think particularly Brazil that you've studied uh, in depth, where the mano dura thing has has been used before in in, in various um, in variations, and to talk a little bit about those places in the region where these kinds of policies, maybe not exact same policies, but of the same vein, have uh, been implemented, and what have been the results of those policies. Joanna, please. Hi. Well, I think we have mostly in Latin America, and mo most of the anti-gang measures have been like monodura approaches. Like uh, I can tell you a little bit what happened in like with the experience we have in Brazil, particularly in Rio de Janeiro. The biggest anti-gang initiative that we had was the uh, pacifying policy units, which it, is a little bit different from what we see here, but I think what we learned from this policy may help us to think what we can expect from El Salvador. So uh, I believe that, so what has been, uh, we call it UPP, uh, UPP, which is the acronym in Portuguese. So it, in, back in Rio, so it started in the late 2008 in Rio de Janeiro, and it was a major shift from the commonly adopted practice of sending uh, the police in intermittently and short-lived police raids to favelas in order to promote smoke short-term crackdowns. And rather than do that, it's, it was a more preventive approach of permanently occupying these poor communities. So they started small. It, it was focused at the territorial level. It doesn't seem that this is the logic behind El Salvador right now. And by then, uh, Five years later, it was quite, I think UPP is always referred to because it was one of the largest uh, experience that was put in place in Latin America. So by the end of five years, after five years, we have almost 200 favelas that have been occupied that reached directly 600,000 individuals that lived in areas that have been occupied by the police. So what this policy was about, first you enter with the elite squad in order to control the area, to promote like a very uh, saturation of police. And then you replace that for newly hired policemen who would stay in the area and patrol the area. So you prepared in the beginning, it was a major success. And uh, so it promoted major decrease in crime, particularly in violence and violent robbery in robberies and other property crimes, but and it was particularly successful in reduced police killings, which is a major issue in Rio de Janeiro. So Rio is marked by the turf war between drug gangs and the involvement in the police trying like to balance this conflict and interfere and the police itself causes a lot of damage too. So what we see, so 10 years later, like 12, uh, it has been like five, 15 years that this policy has begun, has begun. And now actually most of the violence has resumed. And I, I wouldn't say that crime levels are at the same level it was before UPP, but it, it has like, we lost most of the results that we have the UPP. 
by the time by the end like we didn't promote it although it was a big success it was very it was a very different uh the 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 logic of the intervention was quite different from here but you have an idea like arresting people was not a major issue in in rio it was really like to stay in the community regain the control the monopoly of the of power so it was targeted to re regain territorial control, but it was not super targeted at arresting a lot of people as we see in El Salvador. But in the beginning, we also saw what we see in El Salvador right now. It was a major reduction in territorial control. We didn't see by the beginning, like people like uh, the guards around the lookouts, the people who are surrounding the area, carrying guns and protecting the territory. The anecdotal evidence indicates there was a reduction in profits for open, reduction in open air for uh, drug markets and reduction. Uh, but uh, we didn't, so it was major success in the beginning. And as we see in El Salvador, one thing that uh, Mika pointed out, the gangs did not uh, fight with the government. They did not, although it was major intervention, in the beginning, people were quite afraid whether they would have a lot of uh, shootings in this process. And actually, the gangs, they simply like stare and wait to see what the police was doing and whether it would work to, to uh, dispute with them or not. But they basically like, they wait for five years, some, something like that, in order to slowly start to confront the police and regaining the control of the area. So. They didn't, the big leaders left the communities, the medium rank and the low rank stayed there. But in the beginning, so they, they along the, the as pa time passed by, although you have a lot of police there, you still have people around and they slowly and slowly started to regain the control of the territory. And we would say like the, the policy nowadays, it's still there in theory, in practice it's not anymore. And we have some favelas that still have the units, but you still have the territorial control. In some cases, not as strong as they used to have, and others are quite strong. So, but what I, I think we can learn from that, and in addition to that, we have indications that were there were there was spillovers in the a lot and some displacement of the gangs to small municipalities and to like to the suburban of the city of Rio. What I think, like what I think UPP, which is a policy with completely like different uh, logic, it teaches us about here, it's really like what's next in the terms of Bukele policy. So, okay, you start with a major crackdown, show the power of the government and say, well, now the government's in power, we hold the monopoly of power and we arrest a lot of people in order to tell them, but what are we gonna do next? This is. For me, it's impossible to sustain that in the long term. It's impossible to keep people, 60,000 people arrested for 20 years. It's insane in terms of like, it's insane in terms of humanitarian costs and it's insane in terms of budget costs. Like this is super, super expensive. This is impossible to keep. And, and what we know from the literature is that also that a lot of bands work is that really this is trends rather than weakens the, the gang's uh, power. So I think what it's not uh, impossible to say, like I, I wouldn't say that it's not incredible and uh, that a major crackdown such as this one created such big success. I think the key question is how to sustain that and what we need to sustain that is not the same stuff we have done, they have done so far. And it's there all it, in what I, I read about it, there is no indication that anything else is, has been done in order to sustain these results. So I will keep to that. <laughs> and, 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 and just one thing that I would like to add that we didn't talk about it. I don't know the case of El Salvador, but I would say that in most of Latin America, we cannot talk about gang presence without talking to the role of the police and the role of like public agencies in like sustaining that. So I would say that one of the key problems in Rio de Janeiro is that we didn't use the classifying police units in order to promote a major reform of the police. So we use it like, so the key strategy for UPP was to use newly recruited policemen. 
after two, three years, they are not new anymore. And they are under the same rules and under the same networks of corrupt poli uh, policemen. So what we would do to expand the police control of the police, I really do not understand how this, this works in El Salvador, but I, I would say that one of the key things we have learned from the literature in Latin America is that we cannot think only on gangs and on this discussion. We can also s discuss the role of the police and police accountability on that discussion. Thanks. Thanks, Joanna. Um... Okay, there's a, there's a lot to work with here. Um, so it would seem that nobody on the panel would be surprised. Oh, Mika, I see your hand up. Okay, I'll go one second. But I, I was just going to say, nobody would be surprised, and Joanna just said this, that in the short term, as anecdotal evidence would indicate in El Salvador, that there has been a drop in crime, right? In other words, you round up 60,000 people, some of whom are in gangs, some aren't, obviously, but uh, or as it's been acknowledged, that a short-term drop in crime, that's not terribly surprising, correct? I mean, would anybody find that surprising result in, in the short term? Santiago or Ben, would you say? Yeah, I think it I, could be. You know, it could, okay. uh, just like to give like some on the yeah, point, yeah. like it could yeah. be like if the gangs would have fought back, you would see an increase in crime. In general, you see that when there is a war in drugs, for instance, in Mexico, you saw that the homicides spike. So here it didn't. And that's why I wanted to point out about these previous facts that the government did that may have affected the expectation of these gangs. And I think that understanding a bit about the organization of these, uh, of these gangs and their main activity is key to understand here whether this will be short run or long term. I still don't know. The fact that it is not drugs, as it is the case of Rio, it could be that we would. I think the solution, if if we work together and they put like more uh, social preventive measures in these uh, neighborhoods, we could have like something long term. You will have the problem of the prisons. That's something that you need to fix to do some rehabilitation programs, as, as we all said here. But the fact that here how it was organized that you have these leaders that they have a lot of power, you know, that it seems. And I would like want to know, and this is like, of course, this is now nobody knows where they are, these leaders. They said some, they left the country, some, you know, are hidden. But it's very important to know where they are, these leaders, because these leaders had a lot of power to have control over these lower rank members. But now these low rank members are a bit like, you know, disorganized, I don't know. And maybe if they get a new leader or something, then this will have only short run and in long run, you will have again the same problem. So, but I think there is some, side of me that there seems it could be an opportunity here to improve things if we put more preventive programs and these things that we are not seeing so far but who knows you know and actually i wanted to ask uh, joanna about this what did you find in the case when the main business is extortion and not drugs yes this is i would i would comment exactly that i I think something that we should point out in, in the case of El Salvador is that this is a major shock in revenues for them. Because if you are living, because they are like the key business extortion, they really like, rely, they probably like are experiencing a major, major reduction in revenues. And it's not clear how much time they can sustain like their networks and their support. And at the same time, they have a major shock on costs. Like, like they have like, and 60,000 people in the jails that they need to support. So the capacity of the gang to promote this like uh, safety network has decreased like as probably has as never before in any place in the world. So I would say this is completely new. And this, is, this helps, I think, to like to weakens a lot the gang. So I, I would say that I would point out that this would be the key thing. So what we saw in Rio is like the key business activity by that time was drug markets. So it's really like in the retail drug markets by the fact that you could not like really openly uh, sell that. You, of course you reduce revenues, but it's not, you still could sell in, a, in hidden places in other two other areas. So it's not, I don't see that. We don't have any data for that, of course. But I don't see as the same level of shock as we had promoted here. In addition to that, in the case of Rio, it was very localized in the intervention, one at a time. And so in total, in the size of the city, 
each gang they still have several other areas in order to like to go there to support and like to and to support the network and to support the the, the whole gang. In the case of Sal El Salvador, it seems it's a much major shock. So I think it's different. Thanks, Joanna. Santi, and then Ben. Yeah. Uh, to ben, yeah. Uh, just to complement a bit on that as well, uh, I think, I mean, like in general, and and, and related to your last question, uh, Ken, like I, I think if you put in prison sixty thousand people of whom many were gang members, uh, probably definitely this will, this will have an, an impact in what happens in neighborhoods. And, and there's been a lot of uh, qualitative work conducted by independent media in El Salvador during the last year that actually documents that. So El Faro, who's like a, like a, this, this major independent uh, uh, media organization that it's been, it's been very critical of Bukele and some of their policies, they have documented how the welfare of many people in many parts of El Salvador has increased because of this crackdown, because there's like uh, soccer fields that had, they hadn't been used for 20 years, uh, where now like kids from the neighborhoods are just playing, right? So, so I think that there's like a, an immediate impact. And, and if, if I step back from that, I think that's one component of a broader kind of welfare analysis of this sort of policy, right? So you can think of some benefits and some costs. I think the benefits in the short run for many people in Salvador Seems to, seem, seem to be happening, right? But there are very large costs that are much harder to understand. And those costs are, for instance, for, for many, the most vulnerable in particular, their human rights have been, have been violated. Uh, people in prisons have have, is, is having their human rights violated. Uh, as, as Ben was uh, saying before, and I think you also mentioned that Ken, like uh, in principle, anyone who looks like Latino enough and has tattoos is a candidate for being detained with no explanation, no explanation for their families. It's likely that with my tattoos, I'll get detained in El Salvador if I go. So Nick, I can't go to field work with you, uh, at least for the moment. Um, and I think that that, so that puts a lot of people, and, and, but these are not like tangible costs for the whole population, right? So this is, this is something like very regressive, concentrated in particular in the most vulnerable. Uh, and there's another cost, which is more uncertain, perhaps more in the long run. And I think that this cost has at least two phases. One is democracy. Like you're, you're having a, like a leader of a country with a lot of power that's granting a lot of power to uh, authorities such as the police. Uh, and this can end up being very bad, right? Uh, uh, with, there's, there's a lot of research, uh, Ben Olken, I think, and others have studied for instance, the importance, the importance of the quality of a country leader, they find that this is very important, but this is very important, especially in autocracies. In democracies uh, in general, where you have like good institutions, the quality of the leader is, is less relevant, right? Because you have institutions that would set in place the conditions for development in general. But if you think about someone uh, like who has a lot of power, then if that person ends up doing something uh, in a, different direction than what development would demand. Uh, this can go very bad for the Salvador. And another cost, and, and, and I, I'm sure uh, that Ben will know more about this, another potential cost that's uncertain, perhaps in the medium to long run, El Salvador can end up having a super gang that's a, a merger of Mara Salvatrucha and the two branches of Barrio 18. Like using the prison system to just put a lot of people there and there's this, the, the, the story of the PCC, Primer Comando de la Capital. This is why I'm going to uh, give uh, Ben the details because he knows much more. But, but this is a, a, a super gang that was born in prison. They recruit, or at least in, in, the, main, in the first years, they were, were only recruited in prison. So while the Brazilian state was putting more, prison, more, more people in prisons, uh, the PCC recruited more and more and more people. And now they control half of Brazil, I think like half of Paraguay or Uruguay, uh, Bolivia and many other countries. Uh, and it's a prison gang that's, uh, uh, that was born out of repression in prisons in Brazil. So, so in principle, no one would say, and I think like you, you really have to be a very strong state to sustain an effort such as this one. Uh, you have to have enough resources. Uh, and I'm not, I, I don't see how El Salvador can, 
can do that. So I think in the so so there, there are some clear benefits in the short run for some people, many in general, uh, but some like clear costs for some people that are these people has less political power, so these costs are harder to see, harder to observe. And there are some uncertain costs in the long run in different directions. So it's very hard to assess whether there's like a there's like a welfare enhancing kind of situation here. Uh, and 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 and, the, and there's because the, the the benefits are somewhat clear and in the short run you can see them in many places, and the costs are harder to observe. There's like a fundamental political economy problem where Bukele is going to have, as he's having now, a lot of public support because people is only seeing the benefits and not the costs. And the costs might be larger than the benefits. Thanks, Santi. So, um, yeah, leave it there. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Did you want to, did you want to, did I cut you off? No, no, no. I'll leave it there. All right, ben, ben, there's a lot there for you um, to dig into. Um, and yeah, Did you want to add anything to the list? There's quite a few things to address. Yeah, I, I mean, it, 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 listening to Mika and and Joanna a bit, and I and I admit I could have misunderstood um, part of what they were saying, but it almost appears to me the potential that there is a kernel of potential success, provided that you base El Salvador's this this basically prison of 40,000 or whatever it is turns into their version of Guantanamo Bay and they hold these people for 40, you know, you know, 20 years, 25 years without, without trials and anything else. And you just basically remove them from society. And then maybe somehow something like that happens. I mean, they didn't say that, but in other words, it seems to me, and, and I think drawing on inferences from elsewhere at some point, and maybe what happened in Rio, at some point, people are gonna go back out onto the street again. Right or they, or they will be they will be out and not rehabilitated and and likely having or perhaps having strengthened their connections and whatever else during the time they were in jail. Anyway, trying to put together some disparate threads. Yeah, maybe there's maybe there's no fabric to weave from what I just said. But well, let's okay. Let, let me let's start and think about just the with you know within the narrow bounds of sort of criminal justice policy or gang policy, gang outcomes, neighborhood level outcomes. You know, could this work or could this have some kind of positive outcome? And what are the other potential outcomes? And then maybe take a step back and address some of the larger issues that 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 Santiago mentioned. Um, and some, you know, which maybe I see slightly differently as a, a, a you know, I'm a political scientist, I'm not an economist, so I, but I'll get, I'll turn, I'll turn that back to this in a second. At the level of gang structure, what could actually happen on the streets? I don't want to be, you know, I, I have to be honest and say that uh, when the state reclaims control over poor neighborhoods from uh, from organized gangs and organized criminal structures. You know that there, of course, is a glimmer of something positive there. Citizens in in slums regularly report that they wish the government were were better. The government was more present. They'll often tell you, as they as in many of the research you know projects I've been involved in, lots of residents say, "I go to the gangs for help. I go to the gangs when somebody steals something. I go to the gangs when I have a problem with my neighbor." But I wish I could go to the state. I wish there was effective police in here. I don't like the police, though I don't like the way they treat me, but I wish that I could like them, right? And this, I think, jives with common sense. Those of us who, who, who live in sort of, you know, OECD, first world, you know, uh, what, whatever we want to call them, sort of developed, you know, highly, with high, high state capacity countries take it for granted that we have a problem, we go to the, we, you know, if we have a real problem, we have to go to the state, whether it's a, an, an agency or a police officer. But millions of people in Latin America live in a very different reality where the people who are imposing rules on them and the people that you go to to resolve your day-to-day -day problems are often criminal groups. And the state hovers above and might be accessible and might not. And you might go to them for certain things, but the, but the most responsive agency you can go to are the, gang, the boys down the street because they live in your neighborhood. And I think, so, and I'm, you know, I think in different ways, you know, in different ways, that's the reality of, of, of El Salvador, it's the reality of Medellin, it's the reality of Rio de Janeiro, it's the reality of most urban centers in, in Brazil these days. And so when the state finally decides we're going to take over here, we, you know, we are in charge, and it actually goes into those neighborhoods and establishes, you know, something like a monopoly on the use of force, there's the potential for that to be good. 
because it's a way of making full or pleno the citizenship of those people living in those neighborhoods. So, you know, you don't want to just dismiss it as, oh, this is, you know, Bukele's crackdown. It can't possibly work. You have to take that potential seriously. And if the reports that are coming out and, the, and Mika's work and the work of other researchers is, you know, bears, bears out and people in these neighborhoods are now free to move around and free to use public infrastructure, free to engage in economic activities that they were afraid to engage in before. And if the state is able to occupy the place that the gangs occupied and provide basic order for these citizens, you know, on, a, on some kind of reasonable basis, right? Not on some kind of basis that's not uh, punitive, that's not abusive, that's not, but where, you know, truly serve their interests or, or truly in some way, you know, be, be, a, be a, a functioning state. If, if education and health services can reach these communities in ways they weren't able to before. And if the state is able to keep new criminal actors from arising or new manifestations of the gang, right? So you cleared out 65,000 people and you know, so some of them were gang members, right? Some of them were thinking about becoming gang members, but that also maybe is opening up new, you know, potential criminal markets for people who, who were, you know, waiting in the waiting in the woodworks. We need to wait and see over the course of the next couple of years. Uh, you know, just because you've uh, you've imprisoned sixty thousand gang members doesn't mean that new criminal groups won't form on the street or new branches or cliques that are affiliated with the people who got arrested. If all of that really happened. Then yes, you could have a kind of equilibrium shift in organized crime in, in El Salvador. You could have a world where this Mata system that has been in place for 20 years was, was finally broken and the state at great expense was able to contain it within a prison system and reclaim control over the, uh, over the periphery. And it's very important, the point that uh, Joanna made about the criminal economy. Because these groups aren't tied into the international drug trade, they don't have other sources of revenue, it, it, if the state can sort of provide, take over that role of providing governance in exchange for extortion in the urban periphery, then yes, you could potentially eliminate the criminal market that these gangs occupy. I don't, I'm not sure that's going to happen. I think we want to stay attentive over the next few years to see if that really happens and, and be skeptical of claims that it has happened. Um, of course, in that initial moment of elation, people are very happy to have access that they didn't have before. That said, a number of other bad scenarios are possible. In almost every case that I know of mass incarceration, increases in mass incarceration, crackdowns, building new prisons. This happened again and again throughout Brazil. It's happened in, it's happened in the United States. In almost every single case, at the end of the day, gangs adapt and become stronger. They find new ways to operate. As Santi said, sometimes they merge or they form truces right, to confront a common enemy. So, you know, we've seen very similar kinds of, I'm going to end the gangs, I'm going to desegregate the prisons, I'm going to lock them up forever in, in various places in Brazil, and it has never once and for all ended the gang problem. And more often than not, it's led to new forms uh, of criminal organizations, gangs, prison-based gangs that are even more powerful uh, than what you had before. In fact, the, you know, the PCC could never have spread throughout Brazil and taken over uh, urban peripheries throughout a continent if it weren't for the actions of the state cracking down and, and, and transferring prisoners and building new prisons and raising incarceration rates. And so, you know, I, this could be the one case where the state has gone so far in repression that it's, you know, reached a point that may be unattainable under a democracy, but maybe an autocracy is able to repress at such high levels that it actually finally breaks the back of the gangs once and for all. I think we have to be open to that possibility, even though it's a very dark one. But it would be a first. And let me just go back to that final point about autocracy, right? About this is, this is an authoritarian government. But let's not kid ourselves. This is, you know, Bukele is the leading edge of authoritarianism uh, right now. And, and, you know, if you sort of think of the tide of authoritarianism, he's, uh, you know, he is surfing that cresting wave. And, uh, and he's, in, in, in many ways, he's innovating, right? He's, he's finding new ways to erode democracy, new ways to, to entrench authoritarian policies. And this kind of Instagrammable mass incarceration and gang, anti-gang crackdown uh, 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 policies that he puts in place in his, action, in his way of acting is, I think we have to see as a kind of an innovative, uh, uh, not just as a criminal justice policy, not just as a gang policy, but as a really critical component in a much larger strategy to consolidate an authoritarian form of government.
It's, it, he's, it's an integral part to his communication strategy. It's an integral part to his, his undermining of the opposition. It's, it, it's, it's of a piece with his crackdown on journalists that led El Fado, this excellent, uh, you know, this excellent news source to now relocate out of El Salvador and we will no longer have them on the ground there to even tell us what's going on. Um, and so you see, you know, it's, it's, it's important to recognize. And so I would not, I would go much further than Santi and, and not just characterize this as sort of costs that might outweigh some potential benefits, but is really, you know, something we need to take seriously if we care about democracy in the Americas. This is a new technology of democratic erosion. And if it works, even in that localized way of breaking the gangs, we have to come to terms with that, but we have to recognize it as a, as, as a potentially something that's you know, not open to democracies because they can't, they don't want that. They don't want to stand up. They don't want to tolerate those levels of human rights violations and something that would be potential temptation uh, for all kinds of executives who think about, you know, consolidating power and eroding their own democracy. Thank you, Ben. Mika, I'll come to you in one second. You've been waiting patient. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ben, for that. Uh, but I think Santi and, and, and Joanna, just, just a quick point of clarification. Do I understand that the, the Medellin case and the case in, in Rio uh, have one thing in common was the, the, the very lucrative uh, illicit activity of drugs, um, which, is, which is an element, if I understand correctly, that doesn't exist in El Salvador. And so is it also fair to say that because that element doesn't exist in, in El Salvador, the chances for and taking everything bet into consideration, absolutely. But we, but just on, on the sort of the the claims of what success could be, pulling out all the democracy and human rights issues, which I know we don't want to do, but let's just hold it in abeyance for a second. Is the, the point I'm trying to make is the fact that there is not that illicit market in drugs to protect. Does that give the what's being done in El Salvador or some variation of that? better chance for success than if there had been or the were to be a vibrant drug market that were being protected in El Salvador by the gangs? So if, if I may jump, uh, so there are like two levels uh, there, right? So one, the, so the one we sort of know because of our research in Medellin, the second one, I'm going to be a bit more speculative because I'm not completely sure. So on the first uh, side is that indeed, the groups are different in the in, in the in the sense that they like have different uh, uh, and I'm comparing Medellin to San, to El Salvador mainly in the sense that there's no like dynamic retail drug market in El Salvador as it is in Medellin and the first thing that we do know because of our research with Ben and other colleagues is that the 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 the, the illicit drug market creates incentives for these groups to provide quote unquote governance to communities and to like uh, not to be benevolent like benevolent but because in general these are like uh, rent seeking organizations but they do see a value in providing governance because that helps them or, or that uh, allows them to enjoy uh, the the retail drug market with more certainty right so that's what we know now the second thing that I'm not sure of, but I'm going to be more speculative here, is that I do think that, for instance, in the case of Medellin, it, the incentive for the groups to be there is much larger because this is associated with the size of the pie of the illicit, of the illicit markets, right? If there's retail drugs, right? So uh, in principle, the, the competition for the state is higher in, in Medellin to the extent that the groups are stronger and have much more resources and money. So this might, and this ties to what Mika mentioned before, this might open the possibility for this to be like a game changer for, for this Maras in El Salvador, because the, the, in principle, and as, as Ben mentioned, the state can take over and you said extort, Ben, I would say for the government, uh, they would collect taxes probably, uh, but I can see that as being extortion as well. Um, and then uh, and then they would provide services in return and people might rely and, and, and there, there'll be maybe uh, like a big improvement in legitimacy as well, because people is going to be seeing the state as a more legitimate uh, author in an in, in actor in, in providing them solutions. So that might open 
that possibility. What and, and why why I'm not sure about that is because I'm not sure if having all these gang members in prison would create a like a larger gangs and more powerful gangs. Maybe they would strategically adapt to this policy by becoming stronger. Maybe even de developing new markets. Maybe playing a more important role in the international drug trafficking business. There are many ways in which this can this can potentially go wrong. And and just before Joanna jumps in, just a small additional point here is that. And I have researched this in Colombia. When, when you put a lot of people in prison and the conditions are not good, then recidivism uh, improves. And this happens because of many channels. This happens because lack of rehabilitation in the prisons. This happens because there's like much more criminal capital that you can like learn in prison where you like sit together with other gang members. Um, so, so yeah, so having worse prison conditions would mechanically lead potentially to, 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 to more recidivism, which in the end goes back to the point that they would have to put people in prison for 20 or 30 years or 40 years. Otherwise, this will go bad. Thanks, Santiago. Joanna? Yes, just, just to cl clarify a former point, when I mentioned 20 years, is that one of the articles I read they were planning changing the law in order to like to change extortion and penalty for 20 years and this is why i was talking about 20 years but my point that i uh, that i made previously is that typically we discuss anti-gang measures as like measures to arrest people and there are important measures about like the criminal activity economic activity and my point here is simply is to say that in terms of uh, intervention for the criminal organization, I think there's a major difference to what happened in Rio. So this happens to the whole country. And what in the key business, as Mika said, is extortion. Extortion relies on the idea that the rule of law is provided by the gang rather than the government. And by now, this has been replaced at the short term. So the capacity of the gangs to charge extortion has probably like de declined uh, a lot. So uh, it, this is different than selling a listed drug that your market is still there, like buyers and consumers are still there. So I, I can tell you what's gonna happen. Uh, next, as Santiago said, there are several ways there they can reallocate and like they can move to other markets and you have a lot of human capital there, like criminal human capital that will be free to invest in a lot of stuff. And they don't have like formal opportunities and labor market opportunities as I am aware. So, but I just want to point out that in terms of intervention to criminal markets is a completely different story here. Thank you, Joanna. Uh, Mika. I wanted to say uh, two things uh, briefly. One is that also another difference here is that, for instance, in the case of San Salvador, what we saw with the data is that the state is somehow was somehow present. It was not that there was completely state absence in these neighborhoods in terms of what? We were seeing uh, public schools, public hospitals, even in gun control territories. So this gives you some hope that still, if they manage to improve you know, the quality of those state services in these areas, we could have something there. On the negative side of this that I said that extortion is the main business, actually what have what people said you no know, in the field and in and people from the far I remember talking to them is because I always ask them why in Honduras and Guatemala you see drugs and drug trafficking organizations. And they were saying that in the case of El Salvador, you have these gangs that were controlling the territory to do extortion and actually cartels did not want to deal with them because they were not reliable as they were in the other cases. So now you took this out, this unreliable group, so maybe, who knows, cartels would come to these places. So this could be another potentially negative consequence in the future you know, to take into account as well. Thanks, you, Mika. We, we are a little over the time. We got to start a little bit late, but I, I just want to ask one last question. and. and um, whoever wants to uh, come in, please. Uh, I'll go to Ben first. Ben, um, President Bukele has just called you and said, "Look, we have this horrible problem. Um, you know the the rates of 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 gang related crime, and you know Mika talked about it at the beginning. Our good friend Mika, right? Another good friend. 
and she and is, is laid it all out for us. Um, this, this this is unsustainable. We can't do it. Our 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 neighbors can't cross you know street. They can't go to parks. They blah blah blah. Tell me what I'm supposed to do that I can do in you know in a democratic framework and a human rights framework. But something has to be done and it has to be drastic. Are there fundamental building blocks of a policy? If I'm not saying to articulate exactly how the what the policies would be, but do we know enough? about what the fundamental blocks of that those policies would be to be able to combat this perhaps even more effectively short medium and long term without the 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 gross casualties to democracy and human rights is that do we know enough about how that might be i mean it's a million dollar question you know uh, uh countries face countries with you know some deep structural social problems, entrenched poverty uh, and, and impoverished populations that live in or informal urban areas that don't have uh, adequate state services. And then you get this kind of criminal governance you know, in, over time, and that makes the state even let, more leery of, of investing in state presence withdrawals. I mean, Mika made a great point. These places have state presence. The gangs aren't providing hospitals and, and schools. State still tries to do that, but it's harder because gangs are doing local policing or local, it's not policing, but they're doing sort of local low-level governance. And you get this kind of bifurcated reality of, of Latin American cities, not just El Salvador, where there's very formal zones that look like Miami or you know wealthy zones. They look like a normal functioning state. And these informal zones where gangs are walking around with machine guns, you know, and that just gets entrenched year after year, decade after decade. How you roll that back, uh, you know, it, 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 I don't think there's going to ever be a silver bullet for that. You're not going to undo decades of sort of bifurcating social and, and, uh, and uh, uh, public, public goods provision policies with a single, uh, you know, sort of silver bullet approach. The problem with Mano Dura is it tends to see that that silver bullet is just hitting the gangs hard enough and you could somehow solve this problem. And of course, not only does it not solve the problem, but it often entrenches these things. What I would say is, uh, I, I think that the, the El Salvador has in the past been held up, was in, you know, at certain points in the past held up for being a place where, the, where there were gang truces in which at a certain point in time, the, gang, the government actually uh, helped, helped uh, organize and helped strike. And those are they had be, then later became long before Bukele. Those were all that that gang truce was already sort of seen as a giant mistake, and everyone who was involved in it was arrested. Uh, you know, and then Bukele comes in and, and goes even after the president, who was president when the gang truce happened, while Bukele himself continues to negotiate with the gang. So the fact that the gangs are are a fact of life in in El Salvador is evident from Bukele's own negotiations with them. I'm not going to say that those negotiations were good or bad. You know, they 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 were they were um, covert because he you know in, in public would sort of say I'm an enemy of the gangs, um, but they did lead to certain reductions in uh, in in homicide at certain points in time. I think that uh, ultimately there needs to be the space for states and particularly Latin American states and and for and you know US and Canada and, and European countries need to give them this space for them to work with the populations who are involved in criminal organizations to slowly over time bring them out of criminal activity into productive social activity bring the power of local gangs right which are at the end of the day they're often from these neighborhoods right to find ways of 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 of, of taking advantage of their of their capacity and skills, and their even their even their relationship with the communities, to to move to a different system where they're able to contribute positively, perhaps even as local leaders, right? Perhaps even as people or or local peacekeepers or local uh, protectors of their own community. Getting from here to there is a long, long path. But thinking you could simply remove them from the picture and hold them in incarceration for decades, on, and then somehow something new is supposed to happen uh, in those places, I think it's a huge mistake. Thank you, Ben. We just lost Santi, who's about to take an international flight up to visit Ben in Chicago. So we didn't, we don't want to, we didn't want to stand in the way of that visit. And we are over time. But I know, um, Mika, you had your hand up. Uh, I think Joanna, maybe you didn't. So. Maybe I'll give you the last word, Mika. Did you want to say something at this point? Uh, no, no, no. I was thinking about alternative policies and just a, a small comment that most of these uh, gang members join when they are between 10 and 15 years old. So 
there is something, and I have worked done with that in my research, that you need to work with those kids to prevent, on preventing measures. Let's not forget about which were the incentives of these kids to join or not, whether it was coercive, sometimes it was to join just a social group. So I think that that's also a promising venue you know, to work, given that these are very young. I would want to know the age of these people that are in, in prison as well, because that's important. Good point. Interesting. Good, good. Um, we can end on it. Joanna, did you want to say something Any, at the last minute? Oh, no, I, yeah, go ahead. No, I'm fine. I, I agree with, I, I think oh, I'm going to save time. And, and okay. Well, finish. But I, I think what we would need to say is that it's a super hard problem. And like we did, we different several measures such as uh, such as preventive policy, such as Mika was saying, but we need in the short run, the state needs to show like some power, but really like to show like we are different. We want to do something different. We have done that in Rio without like arresting tons of people. So I think show the strength and show the units, show, show the will, the political willingness to, to change is quite important. But it's allowed, I would say that we need to work three arms, like have a strategy for the police, have a strategy for preventive uh, youth uh, criminal involvement, and like in thinking on how to crack down the economic activity. Yes. Wonderful. Not Thank yet. you. Thanks, Joanna. Thanks, Mika. Thanks, Ben. Thanks to Santi who had to run off. Thank you everybody for joining us. We will revisit this issue again. As I mentioned at the outset, video in Spanish and in English of this video will be posted on our website, ccacanada.com by tomorrow at the latest. Thank you for spending your time with us today. Uh, and this is a really complicated topic, um, but a critical uh, topic for the reasons we all know. And, and I think Ben articulated very, very well in terms of the ramifications for human rights and the future of democracy, not just in El Salvador, but in the region and, and quite possibly the world. So thank you, everybody, and have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye.